Welcome back to the Rook View, everybody. Today's episode is going to be on underrated courses in the Mario Kart franchise. And I think the interesting thing about underrated tracks in general as a concept is that it's entirely based on current perception. Courses that once topped my list of underrated courses are no longer on the list. And a lot of this has largely changed due to change perception, resulting from the returning of largely forgotten courses in the booster pass. There was a point in time where the majority of, you know, my top 10 would be mainly GBA courses, but with all the returning GBA courses and tour in the booster pass, there's really only one that I felt like hasn't really got its due recently. But anyways, what courses might I include on this list at the current point in time? Well, let's take a look. Number five, Wii U Flomp Ruins. Now it feels weird to start off with a track that is in Mario Kart 8, but nobody picks this course anymore. And it's to the point where it almost feels like it's been forgotten by the community. I guess it's not super remarkable, but I feel like myself and everyone I talk to thinks it's really solid. And when MK8 came out, it was actually pretty popular. It probably favored the Wii U mechanics a little bit more and didn't have to compete, you know, with additional DLC courses, whether it's the original 8U DLC or the Booster Pass. But I think what made it interesting was that there were so many different path options that explored gliding, underwater, anti-gravity, and it had fun shortcuts near the beginning and end of the course, and it always made for a good time because of that. A level based on flumps is kind of a cool idea too, since they're usually reserved for the Bowser Castle levels. I really think that this is an above average track that nobody ever talks about, so I feel obligated to include it on the list. All right, quick disclaimer, everyone. I did this script about a month or two ago. This is actually becoming outdated in a sense now because the track is going to be a course that's about to jump into Mario Kart Tour. So keep that in mind when listening to the next section. Number four, GBA Luigi Circuit. So I really love the vibe of this course, especially in its remake on Mario Kart DS. The rain and drifting sounds were unique, and I love the different take on the GBA circuit theme as opposed to the more upbeat version in MK8. This was a course that I never got to play online, and it has evaded Mario Kart Tour up to this point as well. Tour brought back a lot of second time retro courses, but GBA courses were kind of the exception where they really focused on first time remakes. Sadly, this is one of the really solid circuit tracks in the series and it hasn't seen an appearance since 2005. And I think it deserves another opportunity to shine quite frankly, especially in a game where it's going to be playable online. Number three is Wii U Super Bell Subway, which is another MK8 course. And I promise that this is the only other one. So I think that this track is creative in the same way that, you know, Sunshine Airport is, but I very rarely hear it ever talked about anymore. A lot of serious Mario Kart players don't like this course anymore because it definitely plays a little bit silly in Deluxe. It doesn't look like a come from behind course, but it totally is. You know, stars are very useful for cutting turns and going through the trains in the underground section, and the final cut is quite large. However, in the Wii U version, this was actually one of the stronger runners in the game and one of the most fun to play in my opinion. I think a lot of people actually forget that now. Visually though, I think that this course is great and it contains a lot of easter eggs. I like tracks that really just play into their setting a lot and a track at a station is a really cool idea. I really like the sign that shows all the different courses in the game and how it's all connected to the same transportation system. That stuff is really unique and I think it adds a lot of personality to the game. The multi-channel music is cool and the MKTV highlight reel theme is specialized like on Dolphin Shoals, but more of a well-kept secret. I like the beginning and end sections of the track that pass by each other and the music here reminds me of Poshley Heights from Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, which is always going to give you bonus points from me. Honorable mention. I wasn't originally going to include one, but after thinking about it more, I think this course should definitely be on the list. Perhaps replacing GBA Luigi Circuit depending on the reception it gets from Tour, but the track in question is DS DK Pass. When thinking about great DK themed courses, most people think of other ones, notably Mountain and Summit. Personally, DK Pass is my favorite over all of them, and this is something I would have claimed even before my falling out with DK Summit. I believe also it's my favorite winter themed course in the series. While not as flashy as DK Summit and its snowboarding theme, I always found it to be cool in its own right. The music was nice and it made it feel like a cheery snowy mountain retreat. It definitely seems to be one of the more polarizing tracks I've noticed. A lot of people really like it, but others not so much. What really elevated it for me though was its inclusion in MK7. It was practically built for that game in my mind. Obviously, we have to talk about the item box. For those not in the know, there is an item box on the top of the tallest hill of the course that hands out stars and triple shrooms, regardless of what position you're in. I have a theory that this was a weird mistake that got past development. You see, 
Back in Mario Kart DS, there was a mission where as Wario, you had to race DK on a lap of this course backwards, and for the whole mission, the item distribution lined up with the distribution of this single box on the top of the hill. Effectively, this mission was just Star and Trouble Mushroom's race simulator, and I almost wonder if somehow they just forgot to make a change to the item at the top of the hill after some kind of modification with the mission. Perhaps it was intentional, or maybe it was a mistake that they decided became part of the identity of the course. I like to think that they messed up and simply just doubled down on it in 7 though. I think this box actually gave the track a really exciting element that was unique to the course. Races on it felt exciting to watch as a spectator and getting to front run on it was exhilarating because the opportunities that were there. It made the beginning of the race very important, that's for sure, and that's not always true for a lot of Mario Kart races. It's not like the course was carried by this one element though. It was a track with plenty of off-road cuts, but it was still one that rewarded frontrunners simply based on the design of the track, special box aside. With the monster tires in Mario Kart 7, the course just felt great to play. Also, I learned a detail about this remake in 7 literally yesterday that kind of blew my mind. Not that it's unbelievable or anything, it was just something that I never actually noticed. This course takes a page out of Sunset Wild's playbook and features changes in the sky for the final lap. While always brighter on Mario Kart DS, the course starts off foggy and misty in Mario Kart 7, like you're in the middle of a subsiding snowstorm. For lap 3, the sky completely clears up. Again, it's just one of those cool touches that we've seen in lots of these courses, with my top courses being no exception as well. Also, even more importantly, the coin sounds kind of went with the music for me in Time Trials. That was epic. Number 2, N64 Banshee Boardwalk. This ended up being one of my favorite retro tracks in Mario Kart DS, if not my favorite. But like GBA Luigi Circuit, it was not Wi-Fi playable, and I just think that that is an absolute crime. I don't mind most haunted tracks, but I feel like this is one that definitely has more of a setting as opposed to your traditional Ghost Valley, and it still contained all the cool perks those courses have. It's focused on very tight lines and driving, and has a little off-road, etc. I don't have much else of a reason to have it so high, I just always thought it was solid and played well. But in terms of how fun it was for me back in the day and how little it is talked about, I felt the need to give it a shout out because I think it's one of the N64 courses that people kind of forget about. Back in the original game, admittedly is a little bit frustrating. The controls, I always felt like I was fighting them a little bit, but I remember the time I had on it in Mario Kart DS, and even though it was never something that I got to play with a bunch of other people, it was always a good time. And finally, we're at number one, and that's going to bring me to 3DS Wario Shipyard. Now, I want to give some context about this course before I just gush about it for a little bit. Because you see, Nintendo has a very bad habit of shoving gimmicks down your throat. Just look at like every recent Pokemon game if you don't believe me. It feels like every game in many of their series just have to have a selling point and that making a quality video game is just never enough for Nintendo. So when Mario Kart 7 came out, gliders and underwater driving were supposed to be the big gimmick. And they made it so obvious. Like, the first course of the MK7 beta was Rock Rock Mountain and we all know how that course plays. Half the track is just gliding. And well, the second course in the beta was Cheap Cheap Lagoon. Gee, I wonder if they are trying to emphasize something here. As you all have already figured out, these courses were very obvious in their intentions. They were literally created as test courses to show off new mechanics in the game, and whether or not the track was actually good, well, that didn't really matter because we got a new gimmick, guys. But then later in the Star Cup came Wario Shipyard. Now, this was obviously a course built around the underwater driving mechanic, but what I really appreciated about it was that it had its own identity. It wasn't just the underwater course. It was a course centered around exploring a sunken pirate ship. The underwater driving wasn't the idea itself. It was just something that actually complemented the track idea and setting. The course also used multi-channel music tracks brilliantly. This is because the music was strictly based on whether you were above or below water, but unlike many of the other underwater tracks, whether or not you were above or below changed frequently throughout the race. There were jumps that forced you to go above, as well as part of the pirate ship being above the water. If you've ever tried listening to the stage's theme on YouTube as someone who's played Mario Kart 7, it probably sounds wrong to you or something's off, and this is because the theme you remember in your head is one that is frequently changing versions. Listening to the theme during the background of a time trial record likely sounds more accurate to you, which is kind of interesting. And of course, this theme is a reference to the original Wario Land game, which is kind of cool also. This is also one of the few underwater tracks that doesn't just feel like a simple oval or figure eight as well. A matter of fact, this track is probably why it was so hard on Dolphin Shoals when Mario Kart 8 came out. Good water levels are rare in video games, but this was one of them for sure. And even though Mario Kart 7's meta combo was not a setup that was very good underwater, I still always seem to enjoy myself on this track. And nobody talks about it or MK7 really anymore, so I just wanted to give the reminder. 
because in terms of creativity, this one ranks near the absolute top of all Mario Kart courses, and it deserves to be remembered just for that. So there's my top five. Let me know if you think I've missed anything. It'll be kind of funny because every comment that I get, I'll have to deem whether or not I actually forgot about it and it deserves more recognition, or if I just think, oh no, it's not underrated. People just see it as good, so... It'll be kind of fun in that regard to have any potential discussions on that. I think what's also kind of interesting about going through the, all these courses was that there wasn't really any kind of pattern for what led to, you know, a course being underrated at this point. And maybe they're just doing a good job now at actually bringing courses back for the first time. Because like I mentioned in the past, I'd probably take more GBA tracks. But it felt like a pretty good distribution this time. But anyway, that's all I have for now. I promised a top 5, not a top 10, unfortunately, for y'all. So that's it. Have a good day. And make sure to leave some comments and I'll see you in the next one.